question asked was, uh, who are you? And the response was, TB Rippy. What the hell? What? What's the lights flashing? Are you touching the doll? For centuries, people have debated the question of an afterlife in which the spirits of the deceased roam here on earth with us. It is our passion to turn that question into an answer. My name is Ryan Zackerel. Someone poke me? Who was that? I am joined by my two best friends, Dave Gear. I've never been scared to the point where I fear my well-being. That's two times in one hour. And Steve Hummel. I've seen things, I've heard things in my lifetime that still makes my skin crawl. And this fight is surely one of them. It is. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. The T.B. Rippey Mansion is a 50-room mansion built from the funds of a thriving bourbon industry. We're here at the uh, T.B. Rippey House. Uh, we're here with George. Uh, George, what is uh, some of your uh, personal connections uh, with, the, with the house here? Uh, the house was built by T.B. Rippey. Uh, it was finished in 1888. He was my great-grandfather, and he is the person who began the distillery at Tyrone, which now, currently the same area is, is now uh, Wild Turkey. He also owned uh, the old Joe distillery at one time on the Gilbert's Creek Road before Prohibition closed it. And later on it was closed during Prohibition and reopened as Four Roses on the Bonds Mill Road. But his youngest son was William Rippey, and that was my grandfather. Um, he had a daughter, three daughters. The oldest daughter was Betty Rippey, and that was my mom. So we're here at the TV Rippey House, and I'm here with Jeff, a paranormal investigator and the owner of Lawrenceburg Ghost Tours, or Ghost Walk. Um, so, uh, Jeff, you've done a lot of paranormal investigations here, and you know a lot of the history about the location. Um, what kind of experiences and evidence have you captured here inside the house? Uh, it's pretty much a range of things, from uh, apparitions to doors opening and closing. You've got uh, photographs that uh, the people on the walks have captured, the people looking out the windows, very clear EVPs, um, just a, pretty much a range of things, pretty much any type of evidence that people can pinpoint in the paranormal we've captured here. In recent years, when I was a child, I came here all the time. And uh, when my great-grandmother was still living. And nothing ever bothered me. Um, actually, I can come to this house after dark by myself and I never have any fear. I, I feel like I'm very much at home. But we were having, I was having the, um, the electrician install the chandelier here in the foyer and I let them in. I put a bag of light bulbs on the mantel over there on this side and uh, I said here is the chandelier, it goes there and here are the bulbs. I went to grab a bite to eat, came back about 45 minutes later, and they had this funny look that the chandelier was up. But they said, is this house haunted? And I said, well, no, not that I know of. I, I used to play here as a boy upstairs all the time by myself, even in the tower. And they said, well, we think it's haunted because it got very chilly in here. 
And that bag of light bulbs moved all the way from the left side of the mantle to the right side. And they were really concerned about it. And I said, well, I guess I'm supposed to be here and you're not. George has just presented us with a very interesting theory. Could it be that when unfamiliar faces come within the home, the spirits of the former owners identify themselves in order to assert dominance over the home and the property? Could it be that this will happen to us tonight? Just a little bit about T.B. Rippey. He was uh, the owner of a huge, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to call it necessarily an empire, but it really was like a, a bourbon empire here. Uh, yes, um, he actually came over uh, with his uh, father from Tyrone, Ireland, is where they came from originally. And he fell into the bourbon industry, and him and his brother ran the bourbon industry, ran a couple of different distilleries. He ran a couple of different distilleries. He was a very successful businessman. And in 1897, I've got records where he was making around $4 million a year, just from Bourbon alone. And that's not the only business he had. He had a rolling mill, he had several thoroughbred horses. Uh, so, I mean, he invested his money, and of course he invested in the house that we're inside of. Yes, as you can see, 50 rooms of pure beauty in this house, oh, yeah. that's for sure. Um, and you had mentioned, of course, one of the things you got to, of course, take into consideration whenever you talk about the alcohol industry is, in the 1920s, you had Prohibition. On January 16th, 1919, the 18th Amendment was passed, making the sale of alcohol illegal. It went into effect in January of 1920, and law enforcement began to enforce these new laws. This created a whole new category of crime, which included bootlegging, speakeasies, and even looting, riots, and murder, all in the name of liquor. This was devastating for the Rippey family, who had made the majority of their fortune on the sale of bourbon. And uh, of course that would take a huge hit to the family because right. that's their business, that's their livelihood. Um, do you know about, about the history, what sort of happened with the family, what they did once Prohibition hit? Um, well, family rumor says that they stored bourbon in the basement and, uh, and I'm not talking bottles, I'm talking barrels. Um, you know, and they were at a speakeasy from the home. Now there's no documents about this because they weren't caught. Now the people across the street from the Dowling Mansion, they were caught there in Prohibition, bootlegging from the house, so we knew that was taking place. So, you know, you've got to realize in Lawrenceburg during Prohibition, it was pretty much like a Wild West town because you had these huge warehouses full of bourbon and you had barrels full. So everybody was coming to Lawrenceburg trying to steal this bourbon. They were stealing it by the truckloads. There were murders taking place. I mean, it was a crazy place. So, of course, they moved the uh, bourbon, I guess, their private stock, if you want to call it that, to the house, probably mm -hmm. to protect it. And um, I'm sure they sold a little of it, uh, you know. <laughs> I um, uh, was here with. Uh, Jeff Aldridge one time, and uh, we were in the room over there, and we were communicating, and on the playback you could hear somebody say uh, some words when they asked questions of spirits, and the question asked was, uh, who are you, and the response was, T.B. Rippey. We said, what do you want us to do with the house? And the answer was, fix it, when it played back on the tape. Pretty persistent. Uh, yes, but unfortunately, <laughs> we failed to ask where the money was, so. <laughs> but, that would have helped. <laughs> yes. Um, we've actually captured, we have two that we've saved. The third got lost due to the type of recorder that it was. But George Gohagen, the uh, one of the owners, one of the descendants of the Rippey family, was present for that. And uh, the first EVP 
that we captured, we were just upstairs talking. We said, what do you want George to do with this home? And it said very clearly, fix it. Now that's the one that we lost. The very next one we asked was, can you tell us who built this home? And it says, I did, very clearly. <laughs> And then so we, there's only one person that was responsible for the Rippy Mansion, which is T.B. Rippy himself. And so the next question we asked was, can you tell us your name? And you hear T.B. and then the Rippy kind of fades out because a lot of people don't realize when you're communicating with these ghosts or spirits, they don't have lungs or vocal cords or a tongue or whatever to form speech anymore. So they're using pure energy. So he's come through very clearly twice. So yeah. of course he's going to fade out. That's awesome. That's evidence right there to show that T.B. Rippy is still in the home that he built and the home that he lived in up until he died. There's been quite a few people that have actually lived and died in this home, or not in necessarily in the home, but died while they were living in this home throughout the family. Well, uh, they did actually die in the house. Oh, there did. were uh, several, uh, at least more than two, that have died in the house, his wife included. Um, she, that, you know, you've got to realize sometimes in the time frame that these people passed away in the home, I mean, you know, they really didn't have hospitals that for them would have been capable of, of meeting their needs, so they'd rather have a doctor come to this house right. and take care of them. When they passed away, they would have the funerals here at the house. I've got several articles that speak of that kind of thing, too. So, you know, they, they treated the house as not only a place to live, but they pretty much followed them all the way through until uh, they were dead. And that, that's, that's the thing, this, this house was not only a huge, beautiful mansion, but it was a home for the family. And that's something that really plays into it as well, especially with these paranormal encounters. Like when you captured those EVPs, George was present. He's family to these people who possibly still reside within the home. So, uh, you know, like you had mentioned earlier, we're not dealing with something evil or demonic here. It's, it's, a, it's a family of spirits living within the home or residing within the home. And uh, that comes into play. And, you know, hopefully that they welcome us into the home tonight. And hopefully they decide to come through and communicate with us. You know, it, it's all about letting them know why you're here and what you're doing. Um, you know, Mr. Ribby is inside of the house, so when I speak to him, I try to speak to him like he is a successful businessman. I mean, you gotta realize that this man was one of the richest, probably in the nation, uh, I would say probably top 10 at one time. And I mean, he's, he's very uh, adamant and he's very particular about the way things need to go. I mean, from the EVP, you can, you can kind of pick that up from the voice. It's not just some static voice that you hear. I mean, you can actually pick up from the tone that he's a very firm person. Yeah. It just kind of sounds like just like a normal occurrences that would have happened if they yes. were actually physically still right. here. Right. Uh, it sounds like uh, TB is very active with the place and still cares about the place. Yes. Um, how would you how would you describe him? Do you remember anything? Any tales he about him? He died in 1912. So I don't remember. I never knew him. Right. Well, I'm, like stories? <laughs> I'm, I'm just or, 71. Yeah. No. None, yeah. He had been deceased for so long when I was a child. There weren't many stories about it except what he had done. He was the largest independent sour mash distiller in the world in the 1890s. Now, my great-grandmother mother lived here until the late 40s or early 50s, and actually I was in the bedroom with her the night before she died. So I was up here all the time. Right. And, uh, I can remember she sat at the head of the dining room table, and um, she always reminded us that uh, children would be seen and not heard at the table. 
But before that, she heard me a lot. When we were in the, <laughs> she would always listen to John Cameron Swayze. No, uh, Edward R. Murrow on the radio. That was before the days of television here. Sure. My grandfather was here, my great-grandmother and my great-aunt and uncle. Artemisia Rippey was my grandfather's sister. And uh, they would have their cocktails while I played with building blocks. And Harry would, uh, the butler would ring the gong and call them in for dinner, roll the dining room doors open and say dinner was served and they would all totter in with their cocktails and, and <laughs> it would, so I can remember all of that. So, uh, well, we'll welcome to the house. Thank you. With the sun setting, we decided it was time to try our abandonment tactic. We were getting ready to set up all of our equipment and leave the mansion when Jeff had a very interesting idea. Uh, we've had experiences with the doll. This was actually found inside of one of the walls. And if you look at this picture, the weird part about it is, I think this doll is actually in the picture. I can't move it this way just a tad. Oh yeah, I see that. You can see a head. Now, of course, it's missing its head now, but you can see the legs and yeah. arms. So this is something the children would have actually... Yeah, this is original. I mean, if you look at the doll... I mean, it's an original. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That would be a good experiment. Put that beside the REM pod and, and see... And we've had experience with it. Um, it'll go off. That's nice. We'll do that then. The REM pod is one of our newest pieces of investigation equipment. It is a static field detector. There is a static field generated by the antenna, and whenever that static field is broken, this device alarms. In this experiment, we will take this doll that was found here at the TB Rippey Mansion and put it on top of the REM pod, hoping that if a spirit finds this trigger object to be familiar and they come close to it and touch it, the REM pod will alarm. And sure enough, just five minutes after Jeff suggests this idea, our REM pod begins to alarm. Did you get record? Yep. Are you touching the doll? Notice how none of us are nowhere near the doll. The doll is sitting on the REM pod. The antenna is up through the doll's legs. The doll never once set it off prior to us. Notice how it's not setting it off now. I'm going to try to see if you're going to have a uh, kind of small verbally around. Yeah. Is that you touching the doll? Can you make can you make another light light up? Okay, you've backed away from it now. Can you go back to the little silver stick that's where your doll is? Just as suddenly as the REM pod began to alarm, it stops completely. Could this have been the spirit of a young child? curious about the doll and touching it, making our REM pod alarm. Did you get recorded? Yep. Are you touching the doll? Yeah. 
Just when we had thought all of the activity had subsided, Jeff zooms out and notices the camera is trying to focus on something that is not visible. Um... This is trying to focus on something. Like something like here. Huh. Like you're blurry. Right. We've had that happen before. Yeah, like... Like it's trying to focus on something that's like... Would probably be like right here. Close to the camera. Right. Yeah, it's, it's still doing it. Like I adjusted a little bit, mm -hmm. just to see if it would... It's still trying to focus on something. It is very unlikely that this is a mechanical malfunction in the autofocus, because if it were, it would constantly try and focus on an object within the frame. In this instance, it shifts focus to something that we cannot see and holds it. Could this be someone that we cannot see standing directly in front of the camera? And could this be the same spirit that was causing our REM pod to alarm? We started the investigation with our abandonment tactic, where we leave all of our equipment in the location and leave to see what we capture. In order to cover the most area, we left a camera on the first floor with the REM pod, the doll, and a recorder. On the second floor, we left a camera, a recorder, and our motion detector to pick up any movement that occurs. And on the third floor in the servants' quarters, we left a digital recorder to pick up any EVP or unexplained sounds that may occur in this area. In order to mark on our equipment, I yelled, and surprisingly the recorder in the third floor servants' quarters captured a woman directly responding to what I said. Shortly after, that same recorder picked up the sound of a bell ringing. This same sound was picked up on the camera on the first floor. But shockingly was not captured on the camera and the recorder on the second floor. This is astonishing that two devices two floors apart could capture the same bell sound, but the devices on the floor in between did not capture this sound at all. Could this be the bell that would ring when the servants were called? The camera on the second floor did pick up some interesting occurrences. This camera picked up what sounds like footsteps, followed by two knocking sounds. Also, the recorder in the servants' quarters picked up a very distinct knocking sound. But probably the most shocking and validating occurrence was something that did not happen. For over an hour, the REM pod sat on the first floor without alarming. This helps us validate that a supernatural force broke the static field, causing it to alarm, and that it was not a flaw in the equipment. If the REM pod is faulty, chances are it would have continued to alarm after we left. Did you hit record? Yep. Are you touching the doll? As we were retrieving our equipment from the second floor, we began hearing sounds from all the rooms around us and began to feel a presence. So we stopped to investigate for any entities that may be on this second floor. That's a train in the background. Is there someone here beside me? Hi. My eyes are I just saw a little uh, Okay, everyone is the... Uh... Okay. 
power stream. I'm sorry, the light just started blinking on it. Female. I sense it's, it's a female. There is some sort of. I wish you had the rim pod right now. There's some sort of static charge. Let me just say something here. Let me just say something here. I feel like there's a lot of different, I feel like I can speak for everybody who's standing here right now, but there's a lot of different types of energy that are coming through right now. I don't know if you guys feel it, but I can feel stuff here. I can feel stuff over here. I saw something over here. Um, Do you know George? Do you know Mr. <gasps> oh, Jesus what? Christ! Me. What? Did you hear that on the stairs? No. <laughs> what? what? There was just a solid, like, Pressure, footstep, weight displacement on the stairs down here behind me. That was so loud, it was like right behind me. I felt it through the banister. Just as Dave was asking if anyone knew Mr. Rippy, I heard and felt a very loud noise come from the staircase. It was so loud that I felt the vibrations through the banister. This startled me and caused me to jump forward, startling Dave and Steve. This sound was captured on my camera's audio. Do you know Mr. T? Oh, Jesus what? Christ! Me. What? Did you hear that on the stairs? Do you know Mr. T? Oh, Jesus what? Christ! Me. What? Did you hear that on the stairs? Do you know Mr. T? Oh, Jesus what? Christ! Me. What? Did you hear that on the stairs? Okay, we got this. All right. If you thought that was funny. You yep. got us on that one. Wait, shh, 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 right here, right here, right here. I heard a footstep right here at the top of the stairs. Okay. Where would you like us to move? We don't know if we're in your way or not. At this point, I remembered something that Jeff had told me. Um, you know, Mr. Ribby is inside of the house, so when I speak to him, I try to speak to him like he is a successful businessman. I mean, you got to realize that this man was one of the richest, probably in the nation. Knowing this, I knew that I had to talk to T.B. Rippy like the businessman that he was. But the real reason we're here, Mr. Rippy, is I have a business proposition for you. I think it would be a good idea to start mass producing the bourbon.
and sending it over to other nations that it has not yet reached. And sending it over to other nations that it has not yet reached. That it has not yet reached. That it has not yet reached. Yeah, I agree. What about Ireland? What about Ireland? Africa. People all over the world enjoying your bourbon and we can just sit back and rake in the cash. Of course, being the businessman that you are, you would get 90%. It is your product, after all. Or do you want 100%? Were you proud of what you did? What you accomplished? Though we did not capture a verbal response, we cannot help but believe that TB Rippy was fully engaged in this conversation with us from the level of movement and knocking sounds that we captured during so we feel that this is a good time to go and grab the rest of our equipment and begin a full-scale investigation of the TB Rippy Mansion. Because of the amount of activity that took place in the servants' quarters while we were gone, Steve sets up a camera with a laser grid and a digital recorder up there. Just below at the bottom of the steps going up to the servants' quarters, I set up two cameras and my REM pod in order to capture anything that might move throughout this area. When just about everything was set up, and we were about to vacate the area, Steve began to see flashing lights up in the servants' quarters. What the hell? What? What's the lights flashing Though he quickly ran up the stairs to investigate these flashing lights and found nothing unusual, watching the whole event from the point of view of the camera set up there tells a completely different story. I don't know. Watch as his laser grid suddenly begins to sporadically flash for absolutely no apparent reason. Just when Steve notices these flashing lights and begins up the stairs, the laser grid suddenly stops flashing. Could this be the spirits that we captured in this area earlier? 
messing with Steve's laser grid, watch again and notice that not all the lasers in this grid are flashing. There are only a certain number of these lasers that are flashing, and because this device runs on a single circuit, it is very peculiar that only some of the lasers would flash while the others remain constant. We cannot prove that this is paranormal, but we can say that it is unexplained. We set up all of the equipment and go back downstairs and out the front door to give these spirits some space. And three minutes after we walk away and down the stairs, the REM pod begins to alarm. The REM pod continues to alarm for about four minutes. These pulses of energy are sporadic and varying. Could it be that the spirits of this house are very intrigued by this piece of equipment? Who's up here uh, messing with the uh, green lights? I just saw a flash of blue light over here. Where? In this room to your left. On the wall? On the just the whole room kind of lit up faintly with blue. Everybody outside. It's my stomach. Can't see anybody in here. Not sure if I'm intruding or not. What's your name? All right. This is where you feel a little apprehensive, isn't it? It got really uncomfortable over here. Where you at? Oh. Still standing in the middle of the floor here. Like oppressive or what? It just feels weird. I feel like energy. You guys are good over there. I don't know. How do you feel, Dave? Um, about the same. Even though the only piece of unexplained activity that we have captured up here in the third floor servants' quarters in this part of the investigation is a small mist anomaly, there is still an uneasy feeling about this part of the house. Could it be that there are multiple spirits that inhabit this area and we are invading their space? Are you happy that they're trying to renovate the house? That was my stomach. Like it's static on my right arm right now. I can feel the hair like starting to stick up. I'm not feeling like any apprehension about anything like that, but there's a static on my hand, on my forearm. Who is that? Who's touching my arm? Are you wanting to play or show us around? I'm 
not here to hurt anybody, so. At this point, my digital recorder set up in the next room captures a female voice directly responding to Steve. Not here to hurt anybody, so. Not here to hurt anybody, so. Not here to hurt anybody, so. Could this be the same spirit that has been messing with us in the third floor servant's quarters the entire night? Yes. Was that in here or was that outside? I think it was the fire. I have to go back and check whoa, it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back here. Steve Drowning. What is it? I saw another like flash of blue light. How far back? Just like in the middle of the room. I just saw it again. Is that you? I mean, making that light? Is that your spirit light? You're not in trouble, we just no. it interesting. We want to know more about you. Of course you're not in trouble, this is your home. At this point, my recorder set up in the room behind me yet again captures another EVP or spirit voice. It does not seem to be responding directly to the questions, but sending us a general message. Here is the enhanced audio. Of course you're not in trouble, this is your home. We're not here to tell you what to do, how to act, how to live. If you want us to leave, can you knock on a wall or a door? Did you hear that? What the hell was that? Thank you. That was on the floor right here in the center of the room. It sounded like a footstep. Like. When Steve asks for this knocking sound, all of us are standing completely still, and none of us move. We suddenly hear what sounds like a footstep or a stomp on the floor beside us. If you want us to leave, can you knock on a wall or a door? If this is not paranormal, it is very coincidental because we have not heard a knocking sound of this tone and volume all night. This tells us that someone or something does not want us to be in the servants' quarters anymore. We can respect that. Absolutely. But we'll go ahead and leave. But thank you for allowing us to come up here and visit where you live. It's very nice. So we'll do what we said and we'll go ahead and leave. Get the tripod on. Okay. With the end of our investigation fast approaching, there was still one more area that we had left to investigate. The basement area that at one time was rumored to be a speakeasy is said to be 
a very paranormally active part of the house, but due to the fact that we could not turn off the furnace, any and all audio evidence would be contaminated upon investigating down there. So to finish off this investigation, we put a camera down there with a laser grid and the REM pod. If we are to capture any paranormal evidence down here, it will either have to be visual or through this static field detector. We set all of this equipment up, and to our surprise, as soon as we walked up the stairs and shut the door, the REM pod began to alarm. Not only did it immediately begin to alarm, but it continued to alarm the entire time we were gone. We cannot be 100% sure whether this piece of equipment is reliable or not, but it is very strange because it has shown that it can be left set up without alarming at all. It continued to alarm until Steve finally walked over, picked it up, and then set it back down, and only then did it stop alarming. Let me try something. Did it go off if you touch the side for us? No. You think it's the battery's dying? But it just stopped right there. Here, can you shine your light on him, Dave? One of our first thoughts was that maybe the batteries were dying, causing this REM pod to malfunction. So Steve tested it himself, and upon getting close to the antenna, it alarmed just as normal. Hmm. Well, it's not going off anymore. Yeah? yeah. How are you doing? It's working fine now. Yeah, it's working on you. I mean, battery can't be too dead if I'm like, that's weird, you know. Something was literally right up on it for a while. Like I stated before, we cannot be 100% sure that this REM pod is not malfunctioning, but we also cannot be 100% sure that there is not some other energy or entity making this device alarm. TB Rippy was a man who made his fortune from the sale of bourbon. Through that fortune, he was able to live an extravagant lifestyle. But in the 1920s, selling liquor wasn't an easy task. When the city of Lawrenceburg turned to violence and looting, the Rippey family was forced to do whatever it took to survive. And this 50-room mansion is now a solid testament to their legacy. A legacy that lives on through the house and the spirits that still reside within it. <laughs>